a very uh, impressive victory this evening for sure. Thank you, appreciate it. No worries. I want to ask you, I mean, obviously you, you hurt him on the feet, you, you finished him off on the floor with a submission. Uh, how did this play out versus your expectations? You know, um, I expected it just to be versatile and not to be, you know, one dimensional. I know he was going to be looking for a lot of wrestling attacks and a lot of just um, single punches, but everybody I watched in the past, they just went and shot on him from the open, weren't successful. Uh, anybody who threw one, two shots got countered very well. So I had to be a little bit creative on how I, I closed the distance. He's a great counter puncher, really sharp with his straight left. And um, you know, a lot of leverage and balance. I know I wasn't going to be able to just blast on the shot and take him down, but I know I can wear him down um, punch by punch and just you know keep throwing different attacks to kind of throw him off. You're used to answering your doubters all the time and proving people wrong, but I wonder, is anything about this one particularly satisfying for you? I mean, all the hype that was around him and that sort of thing. Is, is anything about this win special for you? You know, I think I just, you know, really redirected my mind. You know, Dan Lambert told me this a long time ago. He said, just win. Win and conquers everything if you really think about it. I can say, I can try to make you report a certain way. I can make a fan um, go and say I'm the greatest of all time. But at the end of the day, as long as you keep winning, and you keep, you know, building up your stats and people go back and look at your resume, at the end of the day, they're going to recognize you the greatest of all time. So that's really my focus. That's why I've been so quiet. You know, I didn't overly celebrate after the fight. I didn't talk a lot of crap. You know, I just went out there and got the job done. I wanted to just take the pressure. He had all, I told you guys, he had all the pressure. You got to beat this, you know, one of the greatest welterweights of all time. You got to beat this guy with single punch knockout power. You got to beat this wrestler and, you know, you're going to be a champion and we may go to the O2 arena. You know, I've been in that position before and it's a lot to, a lot to bear. And um, certain certain parts of this week, I kind of look at him and I kind of empathize because I'm like, he don't recognize he's gonna lose. He don't. You, when you undefeated, you don't know. You know, I've been in that position, 10 and 0, rising star. Everybody thought I was, you know, the, the hottest thing on the block. Got knocked out, and it broke my heart. And I never thought I was gonna lose. So I think he'll rebuild the same way. He's tough. He's confident, and um, he'll have a promising future. You got your black belt tonight as well. Oh yeah, I was waiting on somebody. I'm so <laughs> geeked. I've been wearing this thing. To the bathroom everywhere I go. I, somebody just touched it a minute ago. They almost got jumped on. <laughs> somebody put um put a sticker on my um, belt. Well, tell us about that because it looked like I mean from your reaction to that it looked like that getting that black belt might have been as much as this title defense or, or more. You know it's up there for sure. You know I've been um I've been doing jujitsu since 2005. You know I saw I was a wrestler and you know I was started training in American Top Team at the time. I was so ignorant to the sport I didn't know what American Top Team was. So it was a satellite school that sprouted up, and it was American Top Team. It was the first team I ever fought for. So I started doing jiu-jitsu with that team. So I was basically wrestling, jiu-jitsu, crazy shape, and I used to just swing like hell, and then take guys down and do whatever I needed to do. So I didn't really start striking for a year or so. So <clears throat> for me to get a black belt, especially from Dino, like a lot of people don't know the story behind Dean. Dean's a little quiet wonder back there. He won't say much. But in 2006, I was at an amateur fight. And it was like, this Dean Thomas, he's the number one, you know, lightweight in the world. And I said, oh, cool. I said, can you corner me real quick? And now thinking back, like if somebody would do that to me right now, he said, all right. So he cornered me. He came back again. Next time I saw him, I said, hey, man, can you corner me again? Not high, not what you're doing, not what, how was your day? I just asked him randomly, can he corner me? He said, yeah. So after that, I said, I want you to be my head coach. And it didn't start immediately where he gave me 100% of his time. But I was winning fights. And then I tell you, I was kind of putting my camps together by myself. All with him to Kevin Gaston. A long time. I mean, through the graces of God. And, you know, just being tough, you know, I was able to pull it together. And Dean took me under his wing. He collaborated with Duke Rufus. Eric Brown's been my coach since 2008 at Wildcard Boxing. And... They had been asking at the end of that, and these guys just became the Autobots. They work, they work together well. Everybody that's a great fighter or a great coach don't always mesh. Sometimes there's ego involved. If you watch these guys talk about the sport and what did he do in wrestling, how it can incorporate to boxing, how the boxing, there's no ego, and it's almost like listening to a symphony. So to get the black belt from Dean after all we've been through, like not just training, just Dean probably tired of me by now. You know, so. So he said, I am. <laughs> but it, it just meant a lot to me, man. It just, um, I remember walking out to the cage and I gave him a hug. And I'm like, man, dude, we doing it. We, we've been at this for a long time. And I remember my eyes kind of getting a little watery because I'm like, man, this dude has been there for me for a long, long time. So when he put the black belt on me, it definitely 
emotionally, you know, made me a little bit more, you know, rewarding than I was gonna win that anyway. I came ready to win that. This was a surprise. Nice. Entire last thing for me. Lay out what happens next. I mean, everybody's pointing to Kobe Covenant and saying that's the fight they want to see. Is it? Is that the fight you want at all? Is it the dude that needs the Claritin? The Zyrtec? My God. This guy had his chance. He let Darren Till go out there and take his whooping for him. He tried to pause and try to wait to a bigger pay-per-view. His eyes got big. Um, my thing is, I'm going to fight anybody. I'm the best in the world. Anybody put in front of me, they're going to get beat up. If it's Kobe Covington, if it's Usman, if it's Robert Whitaker, if it's whoever they want me to fight, we're going to do it. So what needs to happen is they're going to call my manager. They're going to make me an offer for a fight. And if it makes sense for me, it's going to happen. So I'm not saying I am going to fight him because I don't feel like he deserves my platform right now. He had the chance to be here. Um, he he bitched out, if you want to be honest and frank. He talked all that crap, and then he got in the hot seat. The second he won that belt, I said, let's come get this smoke. He got quiet. Instagram accounts got taken down for a brief moment, and he didn't say nothing. So I think it's an embarrassment to the sport, and if, if that's the next person that's got to get to work, you won't have to you won't have to do much to get me up for that fight. So we'll see. Um, I'll talk to my manager and whoever Whoever they talk to, they're they gonna call next week. They, they already kind of know what they want to do, so you guys are here pretty soon. Uh, Tyron, I guess just off, off the back of that, is, is UFC 230 like in the realms of possibility? I mean, you. Was that Madison Square Garden? Yeah. November. That's why I had that fight at night, isn't it? I mean, it, could, could you do it? You, you didn't even take a single strike tonight. You know, um, I think I can do it. Was that November what? November third, yeah. First week of November, yeah. Why y'all looking at him? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I can fight in November. Is that, is that is that what y'all trying to get? I mean, they haven't got a main event at the moment. Oh, they ain't got a main event. Oh. Where my manager at anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Where is he at? You know, um, let me say this. I'm here to stay. It's the Willie Wade division. I'm excited to be back. Um, as I told you guys before, I don't really believe in ring rust. You know, my mind stays sharp. You know, I was able to train a lot of different tools that you guys saw tonight and really disguise my right hand. And the more I fight, the better I get. And the more comfortable I get, the more confident I get. So I want to stay as active as possible. Um, if November is the date that they're looking for a main event, I think they got the guy. Uh, the dart stroke you finished the fight with, is that one of your go-tos or is that uh, something you just kind of pulled off tonight? You know, shoot, my first, my first five wins um, as a professional was a submission. A couple of them by a dart stroke. It's a, it's a submission that really works well for wrestlers because we always used to be in the front headlock position. And as I was punching and elbowing them, um, I was sneaking that hand underneath there. And I knew he didn't know what I was doing. So I'm like, I'm either going to finish him with these punches and elbows, which he seemed to eat pretty well, or I'm going to keep creeping my hand up because there was some sweat involved. And I creeped, I got it to, all you got to have is your hand showing. Once my hand was showing, I put my stomach on the top of his head, locked it in. And once I had it locked in, I knew it was over with. Uh, one name you didn't mention a minute ago, you went through a whole a whole list of them, was George St. Pierre. Like, he's previously distanced himself uh, from a fight with you. But, I mean, you're racking up these kind of welterweight title defenses now. It's a big opportunity, I guess, to prove that you are the best welterweight of all time, but the fight with him, is that something that appeals to you? I mean, it's always appealed to me, but uh, I'm not going to keep calling out a guy that has already had nine title defenses, reigned over the division. He stepped away from the sport. He came back. He made it very obvious that he wanted to fight certain types of fights, and it didn't look like he wanted to fight me. So um, at one point, I thought I needed to be him to be the greatest because, I mean, who's going to say he's not the greatest welterweight of all time? You know, he beat the best welterweights in the world. It wasn't like he was just running through, you know, guys that was horrible. He was beating studs after stud after stud, and he really separated himself from everybody else. So. I watched him do that for so long, and I always envisioned fighting him, I always envisioned beating him. Uh, and I told myself that I had to beat him to be the greatest, but I don't. This sport is different. These guys are better. They're more well-rounded. They punch harder. They're faster. And they've been training at a younger age. It's not the, the wrestler. They just learn how to punch. Everybody can do everything now. So I think the fact that I've been able to beat the last specialist in the game, beat the up-and-coming rising star, beat Robbie Lawler, who's one of the most vicious fighters we've ever seen with two two title fights at 
I think are right in the top 10 of tit uh, title fights of all times, that um, <clears throat> it don't take much more for me to solidify that pot. But if he wants to fight me, of course I'm gonna fight George St. Pierre. I just don't really think he has to. I don't think he has any interest in it. And I'm kind of over it at this point. And just lastly for me, since um, you've left the Octagon with the, your black belt and, and your title, have, have you spoken to Dana White? Oh, I haven't spoken to him yet. Did he already come here? No. He left. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, no. I haven't talked to him. What would you say to him when you do see him? Because obviously he had, uh, I guess, a few words uh, about you yesterday in terms of like the, the fight this evening. You know, I just um, I just focus on fighting and winning. You know, I, I did a great job. I had my phone taken away from me a couple of days earlier. Usually fight day I have my phone snatched, but I didn't have my phone um, <clears throat> the last couple of days. So I didn't read any articles. But at the end of the day, you know, what speaks louder than going out there being victorious? So um, I, to be honest, Dana might say something this week, next week he might say something different. I don't know. So I don't take offense to it. I just go out there and fight and win and likes me, but I'm not the matchmaker. I'm not the person that's gonna put that together. Um, if, if the organization thinks that one of those guys fighting me sooner is a, is a better draw and a better push for the company, then they're gonna try to push for that. Um, <clears throat> if it was the old days, it would be a no brainer. Those guys will fight to see who's gonna fight me. Um, <clears throat> Robert Whitaker and um, Gaslam, I've already beat Gaslam, and uh, Robert Whitaker is a former welterweight, so those are fights that I will always be willing to take as well. So I'm just gonna say train and stay prepared, mentally sharp and ready to roll. Okay, and uh, we know your thoughts on Colton. Uh, what are your thoughts on Kamaru, especially in terms of in terms of his game? Are there things you see in his skill set that you appreciate watching as a fighter? No, I think Kamaru's dope. Yeah, it's just a lot of things about him. It's a, it's a reason why a lot of people aren't calling him out. It's a reason why he's having a tough time getting fights. Um, he's a strong wrestler, long reach. Um, getting more comfortable in the striking, um, great takedowns, and he has a lot of composure. And you don't get that composure um, as early as he's gotten it. So I think he, he presents a lot of problems for a lot of welterweights. So for me, I, I love the challenge, though. You know, it's, it's nothing like sitting down, breaking out on film, game planning, and strategizing. My coaches really get up for it. They enjoy it. Sometimes, uh, you know, Carlos Condit, I mean, I remember me and Dean watched the first day of footage. He was like, damn, this dude good. <laughs> You know, it was like like not even getting nervous. It was like I was trying to steal some of his technique. So the tougher the opponent has been for me, the more it's gotten me up. Darren Till got me up because he was hungry. And he believed it. And he thought he was gonna win. He was confident and he had vicious striking. He knew how to gauge distance well. You know, we thought he was gonna rush Wonder Boy. I thought he was gonna rush Wonder Boy and get knocked out because that's what everybody else did. But he took his time. He picked his shots. He was very composed. He showed intelligence out there. So, um, yeah, you know, I knew what I was up against, and um, he was more than just a gorilla. You know, that's sometimes it's easy to fall behind, you know, the rah rah. But when you're really a cerebral fighter, fighter, you know, um, you don't want to give that away. People are just not starting to recognize that's me. That's been me the whole time. But I let everybody think I was just this crazy right hand swinging, extra calf muscle having athlete. <laughs> I let them think that, and, and, and I milked the game all the way until we got right here. Now it's too late. Okay, uh, lastly, uh, do you feel, because you, you, talked, you talked a little bit about uh, how your first few fights uh, you won by submission. Do you feel your performance tonight won you over a few new, a few new fans and converted some of the haters? Um, you know, <clears throat> I can't focus on that, man. I just focus on proving the people that believe me and supported me, proving them right. A lot of people put a lot of time, boy, if you didn't know how many people were praying for me today, I was I walked in there with a lot you know a lot of weight in there today you know it's a lot riding you know a lot of people you know I got to support and just thinking about everything after this and you know your platform is not the same as non-champion man life is way different you know so just the thought of somebody can crack you with a four ounce glove and your life is different the next day you know I walked in there heavy and I had to ask for some additional prayers you know what take me out of my own mind. You know, it's God. Give God the glory. Go out there. Do what you have to do. It's already won. The battle is won. You just got to be a willing vessel. Take a deep breath. Go out there. You got the skills. You got the ability. So with prayer, for me, that, that really secured the victory because I went out there. And I just felt light. I just felt light. I felt loose. You know, um, even when I was elbowing them, you know, I exerted a lot of energy. And I stopped for one second. I said, keep going. You got it in you. And I kept going. And that, that's just such a savage moment for myself to just know that if he got up, I still got three more rounds to put it on. Hi, Tyron. There's um, some footage of you and Darren meeting backstage. Yeah. Um, 
What exactly did you guys say to each other after the fight? No, he just said, I don't deserve the criticism I get. He said, I'm a great champion. He said, he, uh, hopefully, you know, I'm going to still around long enough for him to get another shot. I told him to shake right on the road, man. I said, you know, this happens to the best of us. You'll be fine. You know, you'll still, you're a great fighter. And, um, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll sprout from this. You'll grow from this. So he said, cool. And going off of that, you and Darren have had a respectful build up to this. How do you anticipate the build up to a fight with Covington if it comes <laughs> next? Queefy and Tim is not getting no respect from me at all. He don't deserve. He don't even deserve to be in the sport. He, he's not. He's not a. He's a guy that basically at least, at least be like ten percent real. Like when you just go 90 percent just malarkey, like I can't even. I can't even deal with it. I can't even watch it. Like his Instagram page was ninety percent me. You got to check your man card at some point. Like what are you doing? So for me. We'll see. I, yeah, I sound like y'all making a fight. <laughs> is, that, is that what Dana said you want me to fight next? He hasn't said anything. But All right. We want to see it. Now you want to see that man get whooped. <laughs> yeah, uh, j uh, just a quick comment, Tyron. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter the, the, the way you get a victory, but um, this was your first submission victory uh, since uh, uh, 2009, so, yeah. which is incredible. I, someone brought that up on press row. But it's kind of extraordinary. You you fought so well, and I was like, wow, almost a decade. So a little little tidbit, in, uh, interesting tidbit there. Uh, I really want to say the following. So you tonight you've retained your world title. You earned your black belt. You won a performance of the night, and you won the hearts of even more fans. Someone mentioned that earlier. I mean, are you aware of this extraordinary night of winning? And does tonight feel high up there in your accomplishments? You know, I just want to give God the glory, man. I can't even say nothing else. I'm going to be honest with you because, you know, what people don't recognize is when they lock the octagon, when it locks, everything that I deal with in life goes away. Literally. I can be going through the most craziest crap that nobody ever know about, but when they lock the octagon, for some reason, it's the only place that everything goes away and I can just be free and I can just fight. So... As I said earlier, my prayer is just, just give me the victory, I give you the glory. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the weapon of destruction tonight. I'm the one that's going to be used to go out there and send the message. I mean, you listen to the song I walked out to. You know, I think it's a stronger point, stronger message, um, a more positive use that we can use our platform for. And that's my goal, to continue to do that. Obviously, to continue to kick ass, too. So um, when you think about a division like ours, it's reinventing itself so many times. You know, the post Euro St. Pierre era, then I'm the last one. Look at I'm the last one of the era, post Porsche Euro St. Pierre, if you really think about it. It was guys like me and Ella Murder and, you know, um, Hector Lombard and Robbie Lawler and Carlos Condon and Matt Brown and Rick Story and Gunnar Nelson. And who the guy still sitting here smacking people upside the head? You know what I mean? And that's a blessing. That's because of the mindset, the humility. I really focus on giving my opponents the respect they deserve, and we break them down to a molecule. So if I got some new fans, man, I appreciate it, definitely. Um, but to be frank and honest, the people that was hating on me anyway, I was trying to just not focus on it. <laughs> I was just focusing on winning, man. It, it's tough. It's tough in this division to win multiple title defenses. You know, it's, it's, it's not going to get any easier. I mean, everybody's going to come after you even harder. Just one or two more for Tyron. That's right. You mentioned uh, you know watching film with Dean yeah. <clears throat> earlier. And uh, was that lead uppercut something that you saw as an opening? Did I hate him with lead uppercut? Uh, he threw a lead uppercut and you countered. I, I, I saw him. Um, I saw him do a lot of lead uppercuts in the countdown. That's why I try not to give him nothing in the countdown because I'm like he threw a whole bunch of straight left lead uppercuts. Hmm. I think he's trying to catch me because if you if you punch offline. You push yourself right in um, position for a lead uppercut. So what we did was a lot of parrying. Um, Duke kept saying, be relaxed. Have swag out there. Hand fight, hand fight. And you saw a couple of times where I just grabbed his wrist and grabbed his hand. We actually prepared a nasty look, a counter to the rear uppercut. That's what he was jumping in with a lot, jumping rear uppercut. So when he threw that lead uppercut, you just see me kind of take my head offline so I could throw the punch because I was assuming the left hand was going to come next. But before he can get the left hand off, I had already landed the right. So we did a lot of punching offline, a lot of weaving, uh, punching with him, 
You know, me and Eric worked there. Like, actually, I was just looking at, um, I do the series that you guys probably know about called The Champ Camp. On The Champ Camp, if you look at the top of this last episode, you're gonna see the same exact punch. Me and Duke working on it. He threw a punch, I slipped and punched. Me and Eric Brown working on the same punch. And it's just great to have like-minded coaches that see the same thing. And uh, lastly for me, you, you're currently number seven on the uh, pound for pound rankings. Do you feel like you should be higher than that? Eventually, I'm going to be one, so I, I just, you know, when I was ranked for a long time, I used to get bent on and say, oh, how's he ranked this? And I started thinking, like, I'm number three, but I'm trying to be letter C. So once you get to the champion, you don't care about one through ten anymore. So my goal is to continue to become the greatest welterweight of all time. And I think without focusing on the pound for pound, I think eventually I'm going to start chiseling up to the top of that. So as long as I'm... The goal when it comes to the welterweight division, you know, we'll worry about the pound for pound after that. Okay. One last question. Your mom had some encouraging words for Till. It was really sweet to see what has she meant to your career, your life, and when you have t tough times, I mean, how has she been there? Well, my mom has always been there. She, you know, she was the ultimate sacrifice. I mean, she had worked like three or four jobs to make sure that um, we had what we needed. It's 13 of us in the house. A lot of times I was able to go to every wrestling camp, every football thing. You know, I don't know if you guys know, but I've been an athlete since I was 10 years old. I've never had off season. 26 years straight with no break, no off season, straight through. That's been my life. Uh, she's missed one fight and one wrestling match ever. And one wrestling match was in Russia. So that can kind of tell you right there. So just the support system and just the sacrifice and just the mentality. I mean, she's tough. She said, no, he punches the ass in the, um, uh, in the throat and the solar plex. Bring him down to you. And then when I came out, when I came out the uh, I think I said, yep, I told you. Punch him right there. Bring him down to your level. So um, sometimes, just, especially growing up where I grew up, you need that tough love. You know, everything ain't sweet. Everything ain't nice. Everything ain't, you know. Um, today's a great day. So just having that tough love is the things I needed, you know, when you get in the octagon. You know, I was ready for war. What if you would have cracked me with a left hand? What if you would have landed one of those vicious elbows he catch people when they ride on the octagon? I would have had a broken nose. I was imagining walking there, what if my nose is broken and I'm got blood in my mouth? You still gotta fight. I, I play every worst case scenario in my mind and in no case do I think about giving up. Okay, thank you. Cool, thank you. Yes.